Welp, congratulations, Rockstar. You finally did it. You've betrayed the fan base with a horrible port. Everyone thought it would be a proper remake, but no, you just had to go and be lazy and money hungry. Well, congratulations, you now have the worst re-release of all time. That, that being the GTA trilogy. The re-release of Red Dead Redemption on PS4 and Nintendo Switch just came out on August 17th, and it got everyone pissed. Why? Because everyone was expecting a full-on remake. This is due to the fact that there was a leak about a new Red Dead 1 project, this version got a review in Korea, you can use the Red Dead 2 engine, and half of the Red Dead 1 map already exists in modern graphics in its prequel, Red Dead Redemption 2. So when it was announced that 13 years after the original release, they're just going to port the game, everyone turned on Rockstar and got angry. It also didn't really help their case that there's been no Undead Nightmare 2, no DLC for Red Dead 2 at all, and they left Red Dead Online in the dust a long time ago. But see me, I'm Rockstar's biggest meat rider, their number one shill. My favorite video game ever is Red Dead 2, and GTA 5 is my 8th favorite game of all time. Red Dead 1 is definitely a top 20. Just so that you guys can put a price on how big of a shill I am, I'm going to tell you everything I've dedicated to this franchise. I've never deleted Red Dead 2, I ended up getting the Platinum for it. I've bought the PS4 digital version. The Xbox One digital version when my PS4 was broken. A physical copy of Red Dead 2 on PS4 for my media shelf. A steelbook for Red Dead 2 because, I mean, how can I not buy the steelbook? A digital copy of Red Dead Revolver. A physical copy of Red Dead 1 on PS3, and it was pretty much the main reason I bought my PS3. And of course, I bought the new port on PS4 of Red Dead Redemption 1 for this review. I don't think they're going to be getting any more of my money though until Red Dead 3 comes out. I mean, come on, I pretty much bought every version. There's nothing else I can spend my money on, son of a bitch. Yeah, in case you couldn't tell, I kind of like Red Dead. So how did I react when Rockstar betrayed me with this port? I wouldn't know, I don't feel betrayed. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest, I feel like people are making too big of a deal about this. I don't know if you guys remember this, but back when the GTA Trilogy Definitive Edition bombed, there was actually a report that they were gonna make a Red Dead 1 remake, but now that's been dead in the water for a long time ever since the GTA Trilogy. And none of this was a part of Rockstar's plan. They did everything they could to try and announce this port out of nowhere and release it 10 days later as a fun surprise. The leak, rating, and speculation are not their fault as they didn't think that would ever happen. I honestly see this as a bit of a benefit to people because now people don't have to do what I did and buy a whole nother console just to play a 13 year old game. My only issue with the port is the time they did it. It's very odd to do it half a decade later after the next game in the franchise and not say around 2013 to 2015. I think that sort of time frame would have worked a lot better since the PS4 never got a version of Red Dead 1 and they would be doing what Naughty Dog did with The Last of Us Remastered. But now there is a PS4 version releasing in 2023. A PS4 version a whole decade after the PS4's launch and three years into the next console's lifespan. Is there a PS5 version? No, but you can play it on PS5 for backwards compatibility. Regardless, it's very strange that they optimized it for the last console and not at all for the current one. Hell, if there can be a PS4 and PS5 version of Power Wash Simulator, there can be one for Red Dead. And I'm sorry, but I really don't understand the complaint about the lack of the online mode. People did the same for The Last of Us Part 1. Like, really? The online? That's what you're gonna complain about? I honestly think people are getting mad about the lack of an online because people were disappointed by this port and they wanted to make Rockstar look worse and get more angry by pointing out that there's technically less content than the original version. But you know what the online for Red Dead 1 is called? Red Dead Online. You know what the online for Red Dead 2 is called? Red Dead Online, it's completely taken over. Red Dead 2's online took over the mantle of Red Dead Online the same way GTA 5 took over the GTA Online from GTA 4. Also, Red Dead 2's online is much more fun and has better missions, and you can create your own character instead of using a pre-made model. And I am a trophy hunter, I got the platinum for Red Dead 2, and the online was easily the most draining part. The online is the reason I won't get the platinum for the PS3 version of Red Dead Redemption, but that's not a problem for me with this new version. I know plenty of people still play Red Dead 1 online, but honestly, it won't be missed by me. And people always like to think about what could have been with a full-blown remake, but think about what a remake could have been. The port that we got is the safe option. There's no big risk with the port. Yeah, it's not exactly what we want, but if it was a remake, there's a huge gamble. Yeah, the remake could have been a full-blown redo like The Last of Us Part 1, where they rebuild Red Dead 1 from the ground up. Or this new remake could have been, oh, I don't know, a more definitive version? There was a bit of a stir, too, about how this re-release didn't have an Xbox version. But I'll give you three guesses as to which two consoles play a majority of Xbox 360 games. 
And honestly, I don't know what the right answers are. These are the most confusing names I've ever seen in my life. There's also the price point. I do agree, 50 bones ain't cheap. But to me, this game is absolutely worth it. It has the quality worth more than 50 bucks on its own. And the option to play it conveniently makes it much more worth it to me. It's really great to know I don't have to bust out and set up the PS3 every time I want to play a little bit of Red Dead 1. But I do completely understand why people are mad. I don't agree, but I do get it. I was so hyped for a remaster too, and a port after 13 years just sounds asinine. When a remake was practically all but confirmed, the rug was pulled out from under us and we got the same game again. And to play Devil's Advocate, there is a very solid counterpoint that completely invalidates all of my arguments as to why the port isn't that big of a deal and people shouldn't be mad about it. So now that we got the context and drama of this port out of the way, I'm going to get into this review, starting with how this game is as a port and how it is as a game as a whole. Sort of a retrospective review of Red Dead Redemption 1. I'll also be sure to let you guys know when I get into the spoiler territory, as I'm sure a lot of people are playing this game for the first time now, and I'd hate to spoil this great game for anyone. As a preface before we get into the game itself, this game has the reputation it does for a reason. It's so iconic, even people who haven't played it have an impression of it. Like my friend Byron. Hey Byron, you haven't played either game, but tell me about your experience with the Red Dead franchise. Well, my good friend Carter, I don't remember much about the actual game itself per se, but I do have memories of when my grandfather used to play it in front of me as a child. One of my most vivid memories is when he used to just go to farms and mess with the animals, specifically when he would shoot chickens. I was an emotional little kid, and whenever he shot the chickens, it would make me cry. I'm sure you would never shoot any animals, would you, Carter? Oh Starting off with performance, this game runs like a PS3 game on PS4. I'm not one to get upset about glitches and bugs, but like, come on, Rockstar. It's been 13 years. It would have been nice if I didn't have to deal with this. Or this. Or this. So yeah, there were one or two glitches on top of this that happened, but nothing that made me restart a checkpoint or reload a save. And all the big glitches I faced, like I showed you, weren't game breaking or made my game crash or anything like that. It is a bit weird when the game decides to load in textures, they never do it subtly, and you can always tell when they go from low res to actual models. Again, none of these problems really frustrated me at all, but it would have been nice if they worked on it a bit and patched those issues out. And as per usual for a Rockstar game, the voice acting is fantastic. Rob Wyckoff and Benjamin Byron Davis really steal the show as John and Dutch. But all the performances in this game are great, even side characters and characters and side missions and menial tasks you only see a couple of times. And the voice acting is accompanied by some of the best writing I've ever seen. Like, look at the scene of John talking to Bonnie McFarlane in the first hour of the game. Even in this new country, memories don't really fade. My father was an illiterate Scot born on the boat into New York. He never saw his homeland, but to hear him talk about it, you'd imagine he only ever ate haggis and wore a kilt. And he hated the English for what they had done to his great-grandparents that he'd never met. People don't forget. Nothing gets forgiven. And Bonnie is honestly one of my favorite video game characters of all time. She's hella funny, and the performance passes Rockstar standards. One of the biggest points towards Red Dead 1 and against Red Dead 2 is that 2 doesn't have Bonnie McFarlane. And with Bonnie, her father Drew is a very well-written character. He's a bit conservative for the time, wanting absolutely no government interference in the West, but ends up forming a mutual respect with John despite his job. The music in Red Dead is a bit odd. Not in the score itself, no, the music is great. But I find the use of it to be really strange in this game. In one instance, this game had fantastic use of music in this scene that had traits of horror. But then that music continued well into the open world, about 10 minutes, which made me ask, was that music planned for dramatic effect and they just kept going? Or was it just open world music that was playing during a mission and it just happened to be well timed? But here's another instance of music being used really well in this game. For context, this scientist is running for his life across the rooftops of Blackwater. That was pretty suspenseful, right? Pretty good use of music in this scene. Except there isn't. That's not what the scene is like. In the editing process, I added music from Red Dead 2 to this scene to add suspense that it was lacking. This is what the actual scene is like with absolutely no editing on my end. Come on! 
We can get to the roof this way. See how odd of a choice it is to not add any music? It makes this scene more awkward and funny than it is suspenseful. People often underestimate how effective music is in any product. These videos I make are so bad until I add music to them. I mean, they're still not too good, but I mean, they're even worse without it, trust me. As for the open world, it's pleasantly surprising, but at the same time it's a bit disappointing, and I'll cover the negatives first. It's disappointing in the way that it's exactly what you'd expect, but to a huge degree. It's a great interpretation of the classic, dusty, tumbleweed and rattlesnake infested environment we've grown accustomed to in the classic western. But that expands to like a solid 80% of the map, stretching from the United States to Mexico. Seeing nothing but brown and tan and cactus for miles gets repetitive, and personally, I think the Wild West desert landscapes can be pretty ugly. Which is a good setting for two hour long movies, but it can be such an eyesore in a 20 hour long game. But hey, at least they didn't add the yellow filter native to Mexico, according to Breaking Bad. Eh, but that's a great show, I'll fix it in post. Where this game pleasantly surprises me though is, like I said, the arid desert only covers about 80% of the map. The other fifth of the map is much more diverse in its settings. Thieves Landing has a nice boardwalk area, Blackwater is a great peak into civilized life, and surprisingly, a few miles from the desert, right past tall trees, is a snowy mountain range. While this is a minority of the map, it does provide a nice variety in the open world and missions in the back half of the game. The open world of Red Dead also feels alive in its towns, with NPCs interacting with each other. It's mainly just prostitutes advertising their services, but still, they're talking nonetheless. The towns are filled with the sounds of piano filtering through the walls of the saloon, the train making a stop at the station, horse hooves clopping against the bricks of the road, people yelling at and talking to each other. Plenty of open world games feel empty and soulless, but Rockstar never fails to make sure that theirs leaves an impression. The level of programming and a sort of artificial intelligence that the animals have in Red Dead Redemption 2 is insane, and seeing the predecessor's animals is pretty interesting. This game's animals are impressive for the time of 2010, and a good mechanic is how animals stay in certain territories and how selling the animal parts to traders in far-off regions grants you a higher profit. The only real issue is when the animals decide the right time to attack you is in the middle of a mission or a random encounter. And even though this game can be a brown, low-poly mess, it weirdly enough has beautiful skies and sunsets. Here's one small detail about the open world that I appreciate. I'll be honest with you, Marston. They made it so you see the lightning before the thunder comes, and I greatly appreciate that. I know it's sort of nitpicky, but no one ever gets this right in movies, shows, or video games, so seeing it in here in a video game from 2010 is really refreshing. Another little thing I appreciate is how John's idle animations when his wound isn't healed yet is that he'll hold his side in pain. I also love how they make callbacks to a game that didn't even come out yet. Like, I played Red Dead 2 first, which is a prequel, so in this game it was cool to see that Dr. Lester is still in business. These two games are so consistent, and it's cool to see that they added stuff in Red Dead 2 that makes Red Dead 1 look like it's making callbacks. Do you suffer from rheumatism, lumbago? <laughs> As for gameplay, this game ironically enough has a mechanic that Red Dead 2 lacks. There's this weird climbing and shimmying mechanic that frankly isn't missed in Red Dead 2. It kind of feels like they slapped that on because people like the Uncharted games and Rockstar was like, fuck it, put a little climbing in there. Honestly, the gunplay is nothing special. It's still fun, but all these guns don't feel any different. Like, you can tell what they specialize in, but it's either short, medium, or long range, and that's about it. They all have the same amount of recoil and seemingly a rate of fire. This is an issue Rockstar has always had up until Red Dead 2, where each gun doesn't feel unique. It isn't a big problem, as the missions aren't so much about the shooting as they are about the context around it, so while it can get a bit repetitive, it's not that big of a deal. Horse riding is okay, nothing too bad or too good. The horses kind of control like cars where they need to really turn at a wide angle. And you have no attachment to your horse, it's just essentially a tool so you can travel the map without paying anything or having to set up camp. Now I've gotten into plenty of arguments with my brother about the cover system in Red Dead 2. He thinks it's broken, I think he's shit at the game. I will die on this hill that Red Dead 2's cover system doesn't have problems. Red Dead 1 on the other hand, yeah you got about a 60% chance that John's gonna do what you want him to. The cover system is very rough around the edges, and sometimes John won't take cover on the side you want, leaving you completely open to enemy fire, which can be frustrating. Deadeye though makes up for it by being such a great mechanic. It's a good system that not only assists the player, but looks badass and functions in the realism of the world. Yeah, to us, time slows down and you pick your targets carefully. In the game, everything is in real time, and John is an absolute crack shot. Hell, Rockstar liked it enough that they put it in their next two games. So this port came out with the DLC, Undead Nightmare, and this is not at all what I expected. I thought that Undead Nightmare was basically just Red Dead with zombies, but it's so much more than that. 
In the base game, you're a cowboy redeeming himself in the eyes of the law for his family's sake. In Undead Nightmare, you're a cowboy in the Wild West, and there's a zombie outbreak, and you're looking for a cure because your family got infected. But in the meantime, you also hunt Sasquatch, find unicorns, chupacabras, and you can also tame and ride the horses of the apocalypse. Th this is in the cowboy game! Undead Nightmare is so much more than I expected, and I'm glad it is. This is one of the stupidest and most ridiculous game expansions I've ever seen, and I love it so much. It's like the alien or weed sequences from GTA 5 extended to be 7 hours long. It fits right into Rockstar's humor. They also change up the gameplay a bit with bullets being more rare and being the currency of this zombie infested world. Melee combat with the torch is practically a requirement and they add a bunch of weapons such as the blunderbuss. Fire is an efficient method to killing these zombies so you can now throw zombie bait and when they're all grouped up chuck a molotov cocktail at them. My only complaint about Undead Nightmare is that having to save every town you go to to save your progress is a bit irritating, especially when you need to save the town multiple times. I also wish the missions were a bit more straightforward, like I wasted a half hour doing side missions because I forgot I needed to collect flowers for Nigel West Dickens to progress the story, and I didn't have any reminders or indicators on screen to tell me to do so. Before I played this DLC, I was upset that Rockstar didn't make an Undead Nightmare 2 for Red Dead Redemption 2. I thought it was going to be a fun and unique DLC, and they were sure to make some money off of it. But after playing Undead Nightmare, I'm still a little bit upset, but I understand why they haven't made a sequel. I really want more of Undead Nightmare, especially with the mechanics and engine of Red Dead 2, but this expansion is so batshit that yeah, a lot of people would buy it, but I don't know if it would fit today. This honestly might be one of those things that fits best in 2010, before video games were widely recognized as an effective way to tell stories, and were mainly just sort of seen as silly. Alright, so now we're in the section where I'm going to talk about the story, but I won't go into spoilers yet. Don't worry, I'll let you know when I do. Red Dead Redemption starts off in both a badass and depressing way, as our protagonist John Marston heads into Blackwater off the ferry. It's exciting to see him as he has an intimidating appearance, and you can tell just by looking at him that he's not anyone to fuck with. These moments of excitement are surrounded in these moments of sadness as John is clearly an outlaw, and his time is over. John can no longer outrun civilization, and even in these desolate lands of the West, the law has found and caught up with him. One of the first things we see is a Model T car getting unloaded from the ferry, a replacement for wagons and horses. John's life of crime ended in 1899, only about 21 years before Prohibition. So the mode of transportation is a bigger difference between cowboys and gangsters than time is. And showing the player the Model T in the beginning solidifies that the world has moved on from cowboy gangs and outlaws. John is the last of his kind. This is a very interesting contrast to Red Dead 2. In that game, it starts off by showing you where the gang is at, what their dynamic is like, and the situation they're in. While in this game, it shows you where the world is at, and how John doesn't fit in. As John walks through town, he is grabbed and accompanied by government agents, communicating that they're in charge. But John walks in front of them, appearing to lead them, with its head held high. This intro is one of the best examples of show and not tell, as even though no words are spoken, it's clearly communicated that John has no control of this situation. But even though he's the government's toy, he maintains his dignity, because he's John Marston. As the government agents send John on the train, he overhears a young woman talking to a priest, and she mentions how it can be hard for her to differentiate a loving act from a hateful one. And I feel that sums up the whole Red Dead franchise. In Red Dead Revolver, Red Harlow commits the hateful act of hunting down his father's killer, but he enacts his revenge out of love for his father. In Red Dead Redemption 2, Arthur commits awful and hateful acts out of love and loyalty for his gang. And in Red Dead Redemption, John is forced to hunt down his old gang members, people he considered his brothers, so that he and his family can live. When I first played The Last of Us games, I wasn't good at them yet and I found myself to be miserable playing them because I kept dying or barely scraping by. But as soon as I stopped, I wanted to pick the controller up again and keep going. The reason why is because that game's story is so good, and the misery of playing through it immersed me further into the world. Do you realize how terrible that world is? I related to Joe and Ellie more because of it. A similar thing happens in Red Dead 1, where the story is great, and I'm so annoyed and exhausted playing it, because John keeps on getting jerked around and is forced to run errands before he gets his end of the deal. This happens all the time, whether it be the sheriff, the snake oil salesman, the Mexican government, or the US government. But I kept on wanting to play because even though I was tired and frustrated, so was John. And I knew when I accomplished my goal for that section of the game, it would be all the more satisfying when I do. Okay, so now I'm going to get into spoilers for this game. To skip the spoilers, go to this timestamp. They'll begin in 3, 2, 1, okay, here we go. So I've been waiting so fucking long to say this because it's so cool. I said earlier that Red Dead 2 picks up Red Dead 1's threads perfectly and makes it seem like Red Dead 2 came out first, and one line that the Marshal of Armadillo says is a perfect example. 
After John gives the marshal a rundown on his situation with Dutch, he tells John that the more cornered people are and the more they run scared, the more dangerous they are. This encapsulates Dutch's arc through 1 and 2 perfectly, as I, John, and Arthur believe that Dutch really is a good person, and that he really is the same loyal man that he was in Chapter 2. But after a fucked up concussion, being hunted down by the law, and witnessing the deaths of some of his gang members, he cracked. He got desperate, and after being manipulated, had lapses in judgment, and got dangerous. Following the themes and characters so closely across both games is one of the biggest reasons why Rockstar's writing is unrivaled. You don't see much of Bill and Javier in this game, so I feel like these two are much more easy to write in a prequel and still make their characters more consistent. But you can tell that John has history with Bill and Javier, especially Bill. It is a touch heavy-handed in the dialogue, like how Bill says John always was arrogant, but it's also creative and interesting with how specific their history gets, like how Bill says the whole gang acted like he was an idiot. It's what makes their dynamic and dialogue not seem generic. There's also a lot unsaid, but established. You can tell they've been through a lot. An example of this is when Bill calls John a traitor, and John retorts, saying they left him for dead. And speaking of the dialogue, John's is amazing. He's super funny in this game. He's really sarcastic and is always shitting on Agent Ross and people he doesn't like. Dutch Vanderlyn is one of my favorite video game characters ever. His writing is outstanding. Dutch in Red Dead 1 is a bit of a downgrade from his portrayal in Red Dead 2, with specific things like how he murders this woman in Blackwater. I understand and like the murder he committed during the ferry job, as he was really cornered and stressed out. And while he is cornered in this scene, he's much too calm to be doing something like this in my opinion. I think that they made these choices because he's only in the last third of the game, and they really wanted to cement the idea that he's the villain. Other than that though, he's written fantastically in Red Dead 1. He's also probably the best shot in the West because how the fuck did he do this with a pistol? No scope, no extended barrel, only iron sights. <laughs> fuck it, I'm just gonna assume he has dead eye. His speech about how you can't fight gravity is also in Red Dead 2, practically word for word, which shows how rehearsed Dutch can be and how he wants every word he says to be impactful. At some point though, he truly speaks organically from the heart and talks about how they'll just find another monster so their wages are justified. These government agents' livelihoods are based on finding the next worst person, which makes the ending hit hard. When Dutch, Bill, Javier, and everyone else of note from the Vanderlyn gang is dead, and there's only one left, it makes sense for them to finish the job. Even though he did their dirty work and got no credit, John is killed by Agent Ross in the US Army. I was shocked when this happened, but was satisfied, because of course they'd kill him. I feel like it's pretty obvious they would, but John had to do what they said. He had no choice, because he loves his family. Even though it would be easy to see coming, those few missions of herding and wrangling and simple farm work lull you into a false sense of security. John finally got his family back, but in the end, it's Edgar Ross who was the real winner. Until the epilogue. Fuck you, Ross. Eat shit. Jackie Boy's back with a vengeance. This is probably one of the most emotionally satisfying scenes in video games. Finally drawing on the man who killed the main protagonist after taunting him with the safety of his family and jerking him around, making him run errands, is so fulfilling. But while it is emotionally satisfying, it thematically feels like fan service to me. There's not much build up to this. Now that John and Abigail are dead, Jack is the new playable character, you go find an agent, then Edgar's wife, then his brother, and then you finally confront him. You see it coming from a mile away, and then you get one of the most climactic endings with some of the most anticlimactic buildup. I honestly feel like it would have been better if, instead of fading from black to Abigail and John's graves, they fade from black to Edgar hunting, and all you see is Jack's back. And then when he finally reveals who he is, it shows Jack's face, and the draw is still part of the cutscene. And then you get the splash screen, and then after that you start at the graves of his parents, and then can play the free run. I think that would have been more climactic and more surprising, and honestly would have resonated with me more. But I still appreciate the way they went from a story perspective. Regardless of how it ends though, this is probably the coolest splash screen I've ever seen. These are my final thoughts on this port. While $50 isn't cheap, especially for a game released in 2010, I doubt you'd regret spending $50 on this once you've beaten it. So if you've never played Red Dead Redemption before, you should absolutely buy this port. If you have but don't have a PS3, it's honestly up to you. I'd recommend buying it so you don't have to buy a refurbished PS3, and it would be much more convenient to just play it on a PS5 and have that console set up, instead of having both your PS3 and 5 set up. If you do have a PS3 and Red Dead on it, and you're debating about buying the port, it really depends on what playing this game conveniently is worth to you. But Rockstar's Red Dead Redemption is definitely a game you should play at least once in your life, no matter what it takes.
Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you liked it. If you did, I really would appreciate it if you left a like and maybe subscribed if you want to see more of my content in the future. I really hope my point came across well that I totally understand it is completely rational for people to be angry about this port, but I just personally disagree and I was more excited for it than I was angry. Let me know what you thought of this video, how I can improve, and let me know what you thought about the Red Dead Redemption port. I try to respond to as many comments as I can, so I'd really love to discuss this with you guys and see what your opinions are. And with that, have a great day, and I hope to see you guys in the next video.